Lord, one faith, one baptism. You think about that, the unity that that brings, that God, like in a, in a church, you know, those that are scripturally baptized, those that are saved, they're born again, then they're scripturally baptized, right? They all speak the same thing. They all have, that's why when people come from Protestant churches or they come from baby sprinkling, that, that's not one baptism. If there's one baptism, then you have to, that, that excludes all other baptisms that are out there, right? It has to exclude them completely. So Rome's infant baptism and the Protestants and their, their badge of antichrist, their baptism, if there's one baptism, then there has to be one correct one. And if I'm, if I'm going gonna, if I'm gonna to find that one baptism, I've got to be able to find it clearly in the scriptures. And when I clearly look at it in the scriptures, I find that it's believer's baptism by immersion, amen? And it's, and it's right there. And so how in the world could anybody rely on any, anything else and call themselves sola scriptura? How could you do that and then say that you're, the scriptures alone, that's what you're following, when you clearly have no, not one example of a baby being baptized anywhere? In the scriptures it just but it excludes so you and I can never have unity with with the world and with other churches that's why local churches have unity that unity in the spirit right it's it's that one body there together that has that that unity because they all speak the same thing right we all believe that one Lord one faith one baptism we all believe that one God and Father of all right so we, we understand that and we believe that, where you, you won't have that unity with others like that. You can't, it's impossible. You know, and, and those others, if, if, one, if one is right, then one is wrong. That's the way it has to be. If one is right, if there's only one, then everything else is wrong. It has to be. So that, that's how clear God makes it in Ephesians chapter four. So anyway, we'll get to that someday. Who knows how long that'll take.
you know, uh, it's uh, God teaches us a lot of humbling lessons along the way in life, and they're good for us. We learn more from our, our failures and our trials than we do from victories in that sense. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord for his goodness to us. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and, and we pray for Brother Paul. He's supposed to start working tomorrow. And uh, getting that guy back to work. Ready. What's that? Amen. <laughs> They'll be nice to you. They'll be nice to you. Just don't let them see any of our YouTube videos. Don't tell them about any of those, and you'll be fine. She gets all the good stuff. Yeah. Amen. Well, anyway, you you. Maybe, maybe she'll have cookies and probably will. They're going to like you. Dave, what's sticking out of your head? What? What's sticking? Look at that. It's sticking out of Dave's head, everybody. Make him feel comfortable. The hat's hiding, so there's a microchip in there. I, I, you've been wearing a hat too long. There's a chip in your brain. Elon got to you already. Yeah, Q-tip on on. How'd you get that to stick like that anyway? Hey, can you do that with your ear, Paul? Look, he's got that thing sticking out of his ear. Paul don't want to look as goofy as that. He's not doing that. Are you still, is your brain still leaking out? The other side's leaking out now? That's a ton of leakage. You're not going to have any brains left if you keep doing that. All right, we'll, we'll pray for your brains. It's changing the oil. All right, well, pray for Dave's head to get better. <laughs> I've been praying for that for years. <laughs> I've been praying for your brain for years, man. All right, some prayers take a long time, but God answers them. <laughs> it is time, right? Long time to us. But <laughs> anyway, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse number 11. I was doing some uh, I'm studying, some devotions the other morning, and... Uh, the Lord just kind of pointed this out to me, and, and I, I titled this message, A Father's Sacred Duty to His Children, and because the Lord really impressed upon me to think about this verse and, and, and just what's in here and how Paul was speaking of this. Paul gives us something here uh, that is a little bit um, different than what, is, what his main theme is. He kind of, but he makes mention of something uh, about how a father is to be, and he says this. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And there were three things in here that he talked about that we're going to discuss this morning. A father's sacred duty. He says, again, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So Paul is giving some instructions here. He's giving us a hint of fatherhood. He says, as, as you know, how we exhorted, that's one thing, and comforted, that's another duty of a father, and charged everyone. So exhorted, comforted, and charged. The duties of a father. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray you bless us now. Help us understand this great truth. Let it sink into our hearts. Today, help us to be obedient to it. If there be one or two here not saved, Lord, that they'd come to Christ, to know life everlasting, to trust Him as their Lord and Savior. Pray that you would take this teaching and strengthen your children, help them to understand what is expected of them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul, he exhorted them. He had some pastoral care. 
you know, he, he, but, he, but he likens that pastoral care to fatherhood. He likens it to being a father in some ways. You know, Paul talked about in other passages of Scripture how, how he was like a father to them. You know, he wasn't called father, but he said he was like a father to them, that he had begotten them in the gospel, right? So he was, he was their spiritual father in the sense of that he led them to Christ and that he espoused them to Christ and that he gave them and, and, and he taught them uh, what they needed to know. Um, and, and he said, you, but you have one father. He said, you don't, you don't have a bunch of other teachers out there. All these people want to teach you everything and they want to ignore the teaching of, of that I'm giving you. So he was very clear. By the way, that's the duty of a father as well, is, you know, there's going to be a lot of voices that your children are going to hear, but the number one voice that they ought to hear is yours as a father. They ought to hear your voice first when it comes to direction and understanding and teaching and truth. They ought to hear your voice the loudest. It ought to be the clearest to them when it comes to things. You ought to make things plain for them and easy for them to understand. You make things simple for them to understand when it comes to the faith. That's what a father's duty is to do, is to teach and to instruct. Um, they're exhort he exhorted them. They were continually teaching and instructing the objects of their charge. That was the general work of ex exhortation. So, this teaching is, is kind of a clue here that Paul gives us to fatherhood. He tells us by his method of teaching others how a father should teach his children. A father is to exhort his children, number one. He's to exhort them. That, means, that word means incited by words to good deeds, animated to a laudable course of conduct or advised. It means some advising that's in there, some encouragement that's in there, uh, to incite them to good works. We see that in Acts 11, 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. That's what a father is to do. He's to exhort his children in the right ways to incite good deeds in them. He's to encourage them to goodness and to right behavior. He's to encourage them with purpose of heart that they would cleave unto the Lord. The same thing that he would teach them and encourage them. The best principles to be taught to children for their character is spiritual character. The best things to teach them are the principles of the scriptures. You want them to be better, you teach them the Bible. You want them to be better, then you teach them what God expects from them. You teach them about salvation in Jesus Christ so they can be forgiven of their sins and saved by the grace of God and learn to follow Christ. Acts chapter 15, verse number 32, and Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. He exhorted them, incited them to good deeds, encouraged them to do right. That's what a father is doing. He's not only, that he's not just to, to point out what is wrong or correct them, he's to, he's to encourage them to do right. He's to be encouraging to them. Give them some incite, incite words uh, to good deeds, right? Another way to say that is uh, that exhorter, ex and hoarder, to encourage, to embolden, to cheer, to advise. The primary sense seems to be to excite or to give strength or spirit or courage to them, to exhort them, to encourage them, to embolden them. Do you encourage your children? Do you encourage them? Or are you always just telling them everything they're doing wrong, but you never encourage them? You never give them words of encouragement. You never tell them they're doing a good job. You never tell them that you're well pleased with what they've done. You never, you, you never do that. If you never do that, then you're not fulfilling uh, the work that God has called you to do. Part of your duty is to encourage your children. No one else is going to have the primary responsibility to do that. Your children ought to know that you are pleased with them. You may encourage them and t you may tell them and show them when you're not pleased with them, but you ought to have a time where you encourage them and teach them that you are pleased with them. God did that with his, with his son, didn't he? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? He told him on three separate occasions that he was well pleased. You ought to tell your children when you are well pleased with them. Children need that stability. They don't just need correction and somebody to harp on them. They need somebody that encourages them. This world is a very discouraging place to live. It is absolutely full of negativity constantly. 
And it should not be the, that negativity should not be poured forth from your mouth constantly. There should be some encouraging words there. Right? To incite by words or advice, to animate or urge by arguments to a good deed. Paul said, I exhort you to be of good cheer. He told those men in Acts 27. I exhort you to be of good cheer. Young men also are exhorted to be, we're to exhort young men to be sober-minded, to think soberly about their future and about their life. We're, the Bible says to exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters. You're to exhort and encourage your children to be obedient, to be obedient children, not fashioning themselves after this world, but you're to encourage their obedience, obedience to the Lord, and obedience to their parents, obedience to that which is right. You're to encourage that. You're to advise them. A part of that e exhortation is to advise or to warn or to caution them. You have a duty to warn them and caution them. Don't let your children go off into sin and go off into wickedness or go off into bad behavior without warning them. When you see something, you sit down and you talk to them. That's what you do. You don't wait for them to do something wrong. If you see a direction that they're headed in, then you warn them before they get there. You don't just, by the way, you don't just dismiss bad behavior. You warn them about their behavior. You don't just accept their disrespect. You warn them. When things come up in their life and when they, when they come up in their character, you warn them. When they grumble about their work, when they complain about their work. By the way, you and I should lead by example and not complain about our work either. If our children see that we complain about our work, they're going to grow up to have character to think that work is bad. That work is a punishment. If you and I, if you and I have that attitude, we're teaching them that work is 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 a punishment. No, work is part of the, it. Is the, the sorrow that accompanies work is part of the curse? But work is not a curse. The sorrow that would come in this world would be a curse. It's part of the fall of man. But the work is not. That exhortation, to deliver exhortation, to use words or arguments to incite to good deeds. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort them. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. He exhorted them. He exhorted them. He encouraged them. That's what fathers are to do. They're to encourage their children into good deeds. They're to cheer them on as well, to give them good courage. To encourage, it means to give them courage, to continue on. Give them courage to reach their goals. Give them courage, to, by the way, to have some goals in life. Right? Spiritual goals and, and, and goals for their future that they have. Things that they would like to accomplish. You're to encourage them and exhort them to have the right goals. If you're not careful, your children might have wrong goals. That's why you need to know what their goals are. You know, so, they, so you can explain to them, you know, you're shooting for something that is against God's will and you ought not do that. What you want is something that is not God's will for your life. And you ought not want that and desire that. You ought to hate what God hates and love what God loves. You're, to, you're not merely to point out their wrongdoing, but you're to encourage them. You're to advise them. A father should be the chief advisor of his children. He should be the one who is advising them mainly in all matters of their life. He's the chief advisor to them. Obviously, the scripture is their rule. But he's to guide them through those scriptures and to teach them. That doesn't mean you don't, they don't get advice or a secondary advice from a pastor or from somebody else. But the point is, is that you, you are to be the chief advisor. Much of the pastoring that has to be done to people is due to a lack of following their own, fulfilling their own responsibilities. Not all of it, because some are the duties of a pastor to do certain things. But some of those things are because fathers are not, it should be a secondary voice. A pastor should be a secondary voice to the father and, and, and to the father or the husband of that home. He should be like a secondary voice of encouragement that it gives them a second witness to that. It ought to be you that has that, 
that duty and that responsibility that you would fulfill that. That's your, to prepare them for marriage is not my job, it's yours. I'm going to say that again. To prepare your children for marriage is not my job, it's yours. I'm to be that secondary voice of strength and encouragement and to teach you what you need to know to help prepare them. But directly speaking, you're the greatest voice that should be in their mind, earthly speaking, as their father to instruct them and to teach them. You're the one that's to instruct them and teach them. It's a weighty responsibility. Right? To advise. So then if it is looking for a spouse, you should have those discussions with them early on about what a spouse, what spouse they should be choosing. By the way, that doesn't start at 18, 19 years old. That looking for a spouse and understanding the right, that perspective starts earlier. It starts early on in their, in their Christian life as they develop. And by the way, the best examples of that are to be you. you as, a, as a mother, you ought to be the type of woman that your son looks for. If you're not being that woman, then shame on you. You ought to become that woman. You ought to stop your stubborn rebellion against God and get right with God and be the woman that God wants you to be. So you can be the example of what they look for. And as a father, you should be the, you should be the man that your daughter is looking for. Your, your daughter should look for a man that is like her father. That believe, I don't mean, mean personality-wise. Not, we're not talking about personality tests and nonsense like that. What we're talking about is spiritually. The example. That should be the example. You should be that example for them that they look to and say, and they look and they see the qualities of their mother and the qualities of their father and they say, that's, that's the type of person that I'm supposed to marry. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's another way that you exhort them and encourage them. By the way, the same thing goes for a young man in his career. For the future, he should be advised, a father should be advising them, encouraging them, and guiding them through that time of their life to understand that time of their life and the purpose that, that God has for them and how they could best honor God. You don't leave it up to children to choose everything. Paul is telling their fathers, he exhorts them. They exhort, you, you exhort them to do right, you encourage them in the right, you lift, you lift them to do good and right in the eyes of the Lord. At times of unsteadiness or danger or troubles, a father is to exhort his children to be of good cheer. That home should be a very stable home. It should be a stable rock. A father should be that way to his children. Acts 27, 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Listen to me. The most stable man children know should be their father's. The most steady and stable. That doesn't mean everything always goes right and well. It means that they are stable. They are, they are faithful men. They are serving the Lord. They are faithful. They don't run out and, and, and get mad. They, don't, they, they stay by the stuff. Right. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear. They should be, without a doubt, the most stable people that you know. That does not mean the Father will not suffer many things upon the way. They won't go through many trials and tribulations and make mistakes and sin and have to repent and get things right. It means that they are able to look at their children and exhort them and to encourage them to be of good cheer through all of those things. To be an encourager of his children, not the chief discourager of them. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Fathers are to be that exhorter and that example for their children of how they ought to walk. Again, encouraging those young men to, to be sober-minded. Fathers, exhorting your young men. A father's duty is to be that encourager. Part of that exhortation is that part of warning. The Bible is full of warnings. Much of what a pastor does is to warn them. Much of what a father does is to warn. Warn of things that can come. Warn of dangers that are ahead. I'm going to give you a bunch of those warnings here today of things that fathers warn their children of, that they have a duty to warn their children of, and to instruct them and, and help them. 
and guide them through things. The scriptures show very plainly that they to do that they're to do. Solomon's mother warned him, didn't she? Solomon's father warned him. He told him to see that he followed the Lord his God and to be strong and of good courage. Solomon didn't always listen to those warnings. Fathers have a, war, a, a duty to warn their children to follow the Lord, to listen to their godly instructions. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. You'll see a number of warnings here that fathers are exhorted to warn their children of. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Teach him to accept good biblical instruction that they're given. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. You're to warn them. You better listen to instruction. You're, you're to, by the way, that means you have to offer some instruction. You have to give it. You have to have something to teach them. Yeah. I found as a pastor, most instruction that I give is unwanted by people. They, they don't want to hear it. Many, they, they don't want to hear it many times. That's the same way as when you father people, father children, same thing. They don't want to hear it. Not that much different. Look what else he says here in verse number 10. My son, he's giving instructions here. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Sinners will entice thee. They will. It will happen. You teach young people that, you know what? People are going to try to entice you to sin. Sinners are going to try to entice you to do wrong. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You're not to consent to that. You're not to give in. You're not to agree with them. You're not to go with them. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. We see these warnings that are given to children about the character of the friends that they make. You're to teach them about the character of the friends that they allow themselves to hang around. The people that they, you know, some of you young men, you're going to go off to work and then you're going to have opportunity to meet these, these men and other people that are in the world and they're not going to believe like you believe. They're going to believe totally opposite. But what they're going to try to do is get you to, to, to concede some ground so you can be their friend and you, can, and you can spend time with them or you can have something to do with them. Well, the Bible says, consent thou not. You're to understand the character of the friends. And by the way, you teach them the character now. You know what? Let me say this to you. With all, the, all of our children here, it's important that you understand that, that, that you and I continue to shape the characters by the Holy Spirit, by the scriptures of our children. So we teach them to be a good friend. We teach them that they, so they don't have to, 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 to not be around one of our other children or say, oh, I don't know if it's a good idea for you to be around this child. There, that ought not be said in this church. What ought to be said is that I'm going to work on, if there's a character issue with my children, then I'm going to work on that character issue. And by the way, children are, are, are being developed as they grow. And you're going to find out, you're going to see ugly things in your children too. You hang on. Maybe they're not old enough yet, but you hang on. You'll see some ugly things you don't like in your children too before you get your nose too far up in the air. Amen. You might see some, but you know what we do? We take those things and we work on those things. And we teach them that that's bad character, that's wrong behavior, that's not being kind, and we don't do that. Because it's not well-pleasing to God. It involves work. You don't just turn your back on it and act like it's not there and unleash some kind of monster out in the world. You work on it. You pray over it, you labor over it, you weep over it, and you do something about it. 
Don't be a bunch of lazy Christians that let everything go and just watch it and then blame God when your children get older and you say, well, they didn't turn out right. I had nothing to do with it, though. Maybe you didn't. Maybe that's the problem. Amen. You and I, we work on those things. We and by the way, don't you be some kind of snot either if somebody's got, if, if some kid's got a challenge. I hope you're praying for that kid. I hope you're loving that kid. I hope you're not just rejecting that kid and you think you're some kind of angel parent that's perfect. Boy, I'll tell you what. You make that kid feel bad like he's some kind of scum bucket because he's got some issues. Why don't you pray for him? Why don't you teach your children to pray for him if there's something there? Why do you think you're so high and mighty? You just hang on, buddy. That, that little balloon pop head of yours is going to get popped. Trust me. Amen. That's some good hard preaching, but that'll teach you not to be a Christian little snot or an unchristian little snot and look at somebody else and think you're better than them. You're not. We all need to pray for one another because we truly are in this thing together. We are one body. That's what we are. We're not like the world. We don't bite and devour each other. We don't do that. We pray for each other. We work through things. We learn things together. We love each other through those things. You want to know why half the marriages don't work in America today that are in Christian homes? It's because they don't believe the thing I just said to you. That you pray through things. You work through things. You love each other through things. You grow through those things. Amen. And God humbles you and teaches you things through that. And if you have the right spirit and you want to help your children, you'll be able to help them. And you that, that see something in a child that's a concern or whatever, I hope you're praying for them. I hope that's party. I hope that's what you're doing, not just thinking that, well, my kid don't have those problems. No, they got other problems. That you're their father. They got a plenty of problems. I'm my kid's father. They got plenty of issues, believe me. I know where they got their DNA from. I know where it comes from. Boy, that'll humble your heart, won't it? You won't be able to be a stuck-up snob like that, will you? You'll actually love one another. Be like, you know what? I got to pray for them. Because I want, see, my goal as a pastor is to see you all cross the finish line. That's, that's my goal. It's not to see one picked off here and one picked off there. It's to pray for one another. It's to love each other. It's to see them all, all successful in the Lord. Not, oh, I need an excuse to boot this one out. Not really. No, I want to labor just like I do my own children, labor through the hard times, labor through those things and pray for them. Like Paul said, you're offended and I and, and I and I I'm not I don't wax hot. I'm not hot. You you think I don't ever get offended? You don't think I ever you know, I get offended by it too. I just keep going. I don't have a choice. Paul knew what his decision was, what he had to do. A father should have the character that their children can emulate. A father should be able to look at his wife and tell his children, this is the type of spouse that I want you to marry, someone who loves the Lord and follows him like your mother does. This is what a father should be able to tell his daughters. I want you to be a lady like your mother who loves the Lord, who loves her husband and a desire to be obedient to him and to be the lady that honors and glorifies God. Because you are the best example your children have or you are not. We just don't need to make excuses. We just need to obey. It's really what most of it comes down to. Whether it's women in the role of being a wife, a godly wife and a mother, really most of it is just all down to pride, just dropping your pride and being the lady God wants you to be. Not having stars in your eyes for something else. Well, there's something else in this life. No, there's nothing else in this life. This is, this is the glorious place that God put you and the glorious position that God put you in. And instead of you hating it, you ought to thank God for it. Instead of you despising it, you ought to thank God for it. Because there's no greater place for you to be than in the will of God. No greater place. Obeying the revealed will of God and following that. There's no greater place to be. You, the, the world will offer you every flash in the pan and everything else, but there will be nothing, nothing that is better than God's will. Amen. We're to exhort them because they need it. Paul lists that exhortation first, that encouragement, that warning, that sacred duty of a father to teach his children, that he teaches them to be holy, that he teaches them to abstain from all appearance of evil, to walk circumspectly by doing that himself as well. 
Next, we see a father is to comfort his children. He's to be a great source of comfort. Paul said, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted. He's to be a source of comfort to his children. Paul, he was a great comfort. Let me ask you a question. Do you comfort your children? There are times that they're in need of comfort and not correction. You know, many times you can see something in a child that is, you know, concerning to you or their behavior might be off. And sometimes it's not the, the first thing that you think of shouldn't be to pull out the rod and use it. First thing you ought to do is sit down and talk to them and find out why. Why are they doing this? Ask them. Speak to them. Talk to them. Communicate with them. And ask them why. Sometimes you'll, find, sometimes you'll find out that that child is extremely uncomfortable with something. There's something that is not, there's something that's wrong. There's something that's not, that's not right. Or it may be, maybe it's a misunderstanding. It's something that they don't understand. They're confused about something or they don't under, or they're not comfortable with, 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 with something or something's happening in their life that's making them extremely uncomfortable and they don't like it. And they want to talk about it. Right? They want to get the truth out. They want to find out why. Right? Why is it like that? Why? And you sit down and you have a conversation with them. Ask them, what's wrong? Right? What's wrong? And they are able to tell you what's wrong. They're able to tell you that they have certain trials and challenges or certain things that, 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 that they're upset about or that they don't like something. Or they, maybe they misunderstand something. Maybe they don't, they're not, they, they don't understand something. They don't get it. Right? And you sit there and you, and you explain it to them. Talk to them. You ask them why. Why do you feel that way? Or what, why are you upset about this? Or why does this bother you? And sometimes it's, sometimes it's it, okay. To you as a parent, it will seem very corny or very little. But you forget what it's like to be a young person. You forget what it's like to have a thousand different emotions in your brain and thoughts in your mind and, and, and they're growing, they're maturing, they're going through different things. It's not always because they're trying to be a little hateful, Satanist, wicked devil. It, sometimes it's just because they're, they're, they're trying to get through things. They, they're, they're confused. They don't like things. They're uncomfortable with things. Life is changing around them. It involves you having a conversation with them and telling them, you know what, it is okay. You're going to be okay. Sometimes you, just got to, sometimes you just got to put your arm around them. You're going to be fine. Everything will be fine. That's, that's part of your duty. By the way, especially daughters. Uh, as, as a son, uh, as, a, as a father, your daughter needs that proper biblical affection from her father. They need that. They need you to put an arm around them. They need you to, they need you to hug them. They need you to love them. They need you, they need you to be that, that man, right, that teaches them that, that proper respect for them and that proper care and love for them. They need a father. They, they do. They don't just need a figurehead. They need a father. That, that's, they, they need that. Children grow up correctly when they have that proper affection and care, right? Even your son, he needs that too. They need that. You need to know that everything's fine. Everything will be fine. You'll be all right. right? You'll get through this. There's awkward times for children. They grow up. Remember how weird it was to grow up? I remember how weird it was to grow up. I think it's still weird now, but uh, I remember how weird it was, how things were strange, how you... Just life is weird when you're growing up, when you're young. It's just things can be very strange. And, and sometimes you, you grow up with that, that type of uh, mentality, you know, of, of um, you know, not understanding why things happen the way they do. And children need comfort in. They really do. They need that comfort. Do you comfort them? Sometimes they need to know that everything is fine. Children grow up with much uncertainty in their minds. There's a lot of uncertainty with children. 
because they're not in control of their own destiny. I mean, they have two parents, and if their parents decide, if their parents make bad decisions or do wrong things, then it affects their life. Their life is going to be affected by what's going on. Their life is going to be affected by how something is, is done, right? Their life is going to be, you know, and they don't really have a say in how things go. They're just like along for the ride in that sense, you know. They don't have a say of how things are going to work out. So, so life can be extremely uh, challenging for that, for them. And you need to be, be a source of that stability and comfort for them. To explain that to them. Okay, well, everything's going to be okay. And this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Right? And, and so they can, they can understand some of those things. Children uh, should grow up in stable homes. A stable mother and a stable and steady father. As a mother, you ought not be a someone whose emotions carry her away. You also ought not be stoic with no emotions. There, there should be a balance there of, 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 of some of that, but not that the, your emotions should not take you. They should not lead you. They should not cause you to be irritated and excited to a point to where you become a bad testimony. Right? That you become disrespectful to your husband. Or that you become out of control with your children. That all takes spirit control. But children should have, a father should be leading and, and giving that source of comfort to his wife too as well. By the way, ladies can be, they, they, at times they can be very afraid too. As a father, as you're, you're a husband also, obviously first you're a husband in that sense, then you're a father. But you also help provide stability in the home when mom doesn't have to be concerned with things that she ought not be concerned with. It's not her job to do some of those things. The confrontational things with outside people and things should not really be your wife doing. You. You should be confrontational. Because you're trying to promote your wife to be stable and peaceful. You, she shouldn't be the one being confrontational. By the way, it's, it doesn't look well. It doesn't look good either. When women get extremely confrontational. It's not the right look. It's not the way, way women are supposed to be in that sense. Hmm. Your children should grow up in a stable home, a consistent home, not like Reuben who is unstable as water. It says, thou shalt not excel. In a home, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Your, your children, your children should see one way in that house, God's way. They should see the father leading, the mother following. They should be the children obeying. That should be the direction. That's what's to be taught, right? Not manipulation, not other things, but those things that are very plain and very true and things that we hold to, things that we can see in the scriptures. They should be, that, that, that's a stable upbringing that children should have. They should not see a husband and wife fighting with each other, arguing with each other speaking ill of each other. They shouldn't see that. They shouldn't hear you speak unkind words to each other or a mother arguing with a father. You, you can lose an argument and win someone's heart quite a bit. In fact, that's the only way, lady, you are never instructed. You are never instructed to preach to your husband. You are instructed for your life to speak to him. Your manner of conversation. It goes way farther than any words you can have. Your example goes farther than your words. And Peter says that very plainly, and there's a purpose for that, because Men naturally, when a woman says much to them in, in the way of any type of uh, that, men will naturally, literally, they shut it off. Men will just shut it off. They'll just be like, no. Go up to the room. Safer there. That's just, that's just the truth of it. But her life and her example will build respect from that man. Because he can't argue with it. 
but he can't argue with the words and the banter that goes back and forth. Amen. <clears throat> a father that is stable, that brings comfort to the heart of the child, knowing that dad is stable, steady, and faithful, that is comforting for them to know that whatever is going on, that dad will remain faithful to the word of God. That he has the book that he follows. And you can always know where he stands. You never have to wonder where your father stands if he stands on the word of God. And you never have to wonder, well, was he going to do right? You shouldn't have to wonder that. Your children shouldn't have to wonder that. You shouldn't. If you've obeyed the Lord, if you've followed the Lord, if you have a track record to follow, then they don't have to wonder if you're going to do right. They know you're going to do right. And, they, and that brings stability to them. If a mother does that, that brings stability to them. Amen. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number two, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Second Timothy chapter two, verse number two says that. It says that the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. They are faithful men and that comforts their children. They are not wildly changing positions back and forth and wreaking havoc and putting confusion on their children. They are, they are consistently following the Lord through all things, no matter what happens. Like Paul said, none of these things move me. In. Either count I my life dear. He looks at them in a matter, if inside there's a tornado going on in his mind and his heart, he looks at them and says, all will be well. Christ is still on the throne, and we will remain steady and stable and strong and steadfast. Children need that steadfastness. They need that steadiness. It brings comfort. The Apostle Paul knew that that's why, as the Apostle of the Gentiles, he learned that whatsoever state he was in there was to be content. If he was out of jail and suffering afflictions, he exhorted and encouraged and comforted the saints by telling them that none of these things moved him. Don't be moved away from the Lord because of my afflictions. Because I am not sorry that I have followed Christ. I have no regrets. And as a father, let me tell my own children, as a spiritual father, let me tell you, I have no regrets for following the Lord, none whatsoever. I may regret the mistakes I've made along the way, but I thank God that he counted me worthy putting me into the ministry. And I do not regret following Christ. I have zero regrets about that. Amen. I have none. No matter what has befell me, no matter what I've been through. I just sat back there when we were singing that song, Trusting Jesus, that is all. And, 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 I, and I started to tear up because I thought about how much God had delivered me from. How much he had delivered me through. How faithful God was to keep me through it all. And, he, and it's as if he whispers into my soul, have not I kept you through all these things? Have not I kept you through it all? Did, have I not made you to succeed through all of these things and kept you in the way that you should go? Have I ever let any of them truly harm you or any of these things ever harm you along the way? Have they not all went to your good and to the good of others? And I can say, yes, they have. Because whatever abased my flesh was good for my spirit. Whatever abased my pride was good for my spirit and well profitable to the ministry. It will be for you the same. When your pride is abased, you will be spiritually successful. When you are lifted up, you will not be. Great comfort should be given to children at times of instability. In times of trial, it is a father's sacred duty to give that steady comfort to his children. To comfort them with the Bible. Showing them that it is always right to follow God. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. A father is to be a source of comfort for his children. To put, his, to put his arm around them, to pray for them. When they are afraid, to show them who to trust. When they are afraid, and exhort them and comfort them. To trust the Lord. It's part of a father's sacred duty before God. 
I hope you're doing that. I hope you're comforting your children. I hope you're being a source of comfort for them, not only a source of correction and instruction to them, but a source of comfort to them. You know what helps is when you're a faithful person, you're like, I know where my dad is right now. I know what my dad's doing right now. I know exactly what he's doing right now. Right? know what he's doing right now what he always does right that's how these people that fall that that may fall away for a short time they may come back because they see the faithfulness of God's church don't think there aren't people watching right now this church and still watching and have been watching for years don't think that they're not thinking about that they're wondering how do they remain faithful through all these things by the Spirit of God by the power of our God that's how and they continue and they continue into the same things week after week, year after year, laboring and continuing and growing and learning. How? By the grace of God. Amen. And lastly, a father is to charge his children. That which is enjoined, committed, entrusted, or delivered to another. How long this one? Oh boy. It's the last point, Brother Scott. But it's a certainly it's certainly a long point. But I got Baptist history in the afternoon, but a lot of it's scripture, so we'll finish this. I think we can. All right. We're doing Baptist history. Amen. This afternoon, Lord willing. I want to get into the Albigenses. I'm looking forward to it a while since we got to teach them Baptist histories. A father is to charge his children, that which is enjoined, committed, entrusted, or delivered to another. A charge that is given an order, an injunction, a mandate, a command. Hence the word includes any trust or commission, an office, a duty of employment. Yeah. Instruction given by a judge or a jury, right, to charge them. A father is to order his children, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. He is to command them and take command of them. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. That's what Paul said, right? 1 Timothy 1, 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. He charged them. Don't you teach any other doctrine? He commanded them. 1 Timothy 5, 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partially. 1 Timothy 6, 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, under the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, what is a father to charge his children with? He's to instruct them. Hear the instructions of thy father. Let me ask you, Father, are you instructing them? Have you, let, have you left it up to their mother and created an improper balance in the home by not teaching them that a father instructs his own children? Say, well, that's my wife's duty. No, it's your duty too. They need the instruction of a father. Amen. 1 Samuel 3.13, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever. For the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. He didn't restrain his sons. Eli didn't. He didn't instruct them. That instruction should include restraining evil, not only in an authoritative, but in an affectionate way. And also with solid wisdom and judgment, for in such a relation with an interest in your welfare, such as a father feels for his children, and with such a method as a father would use not done in a harsh, dictatorial, and arbitrary manner, but in tenderness and love. There's sometimes, you, yeah, there's sometimes, hey, don't do that, you got to be strict, right? There's other times when you ought to be able to sit down with them and lovingly teach them, right? That you guide them. It's like when, when I taught on different, when I've taught on different subjects, sometimes you'll notice I'm sitting down and I have a microphone and I'm teaching, you know, and, I, and I'm teaching on like the history of something or I'm teaching on modesty or I'm teaching on some of those other things and I'll slow it down a little bit and teach a little bit different and specific on those things. There's a purpose and a reason for that because that's, that's, 
that's a teachable time that you have to kind of slow down and deal with those things on a personal on a personal level and a little bit slower than just blasting it out. It's got to be something that is that is a little bit different. There are times that a father's instruction must be that tender and kind, personal, not just a general exhortation or an instruction, but personally prescribing to the person directly. There are certain things that maybe one of your children, if you, as you watch them, there's something that they need. Well, that involves you taking them and off by themselves and teaching them what they need. If you see something that they need, or if their mother brings something up to you, uh, so-and-so is, looks like they're you know, kind of having a problem with this. What do you think about that? And that means that you pray about that and you go, you know what, I need to talk to them about that. I need to have a discussion with them. I need to give them some instructions. I'm to instruct my children and charge them to follow the word of God. Right? I'll give you an example of that. Um, uh, this, this is, I'll give you an example. I, I have, as you know, I have five daughters. So, this world wants to teach my daughters feminism. Like everywhere I go, they want to teach them feminism. Everywhere I take them, they want to teach them, they want to drill it into them feminism. They want to lift up the career woman. They want to lift up those things. They're there, and they, they want to teach that. Family members, uh, you know, other people like, they, they want to teach that, right? So I'm very sensitive to that. When I listen to it, when I hear it, I'm very sensitive to it. And, you know, I don't, we were somewhere in, in um, Kansas City and we were at, and, and one of their, their aunts was there and, you know, uh, showing some things and, and uh, you know, she, she actually got invited this a month ago or a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, to the White House to decorate the White House because she's an interior decorator. And, and you know, that sounds very prestigious. To the world, that would be pretty amazing, right, to do that and, and everything like that. Well, I made sure my daughters understood that if, if that was ever their life, I would consider myself an absolute failure. I absolutely, I, I, I absolutely would. Why? There's nothing grand about being outside of God's will. There's nothing pretty and decorated about being outside of God's will, right? There's nothing, there's nothing wonderful and glamorous about that. God's will is very plain for a lady. God's will is very clear for them. And I explained it, I explained it to them. I, I also explained it when they go to the library and they get books and there's women there and they, these women, they say that. And I explained to them, look, don't, don't look at these people as people that you're to look up to. Now, we care for their souls, and we love them because uh, we're to love our neighbors, you know, and, and we care for them. But that's not the life that you're to live. That's not the life that God has laid down in the scriptures for you to live. That's not successful. That's very unsuccessful. That life, see, I teach the opposite of what the world does. The world teaches that, oh, you can be anything you want to be. And I'll tell you, yeah, if you want to lose your life. If you want to gain the whole world and lose your own soul. If you, want to, if you want to be a bad testimony, a bad example of why God made you. See, that don't set well with people today. But all I ask you, prove me wrong. I dare you! Do it! All these, all these preachers out here building their Bible colleges off talking girls like this to go there to attract boys. Girls like these young ladies here to attract them. They want you to send your daughters to them to attract them. That's what they want. They want all, the, they want all these girls to go to their Bible colleges to build their Bible colleges up. Why? So what do they do in all their photos? They show these pretty girls. That's what they show. So they want to take all of our pretty young ladies and they want to take all of you ladies and they want to just bring them in and they want to throw them in there and say, hey, you know what, why? So while they can meet and do all this other stuff and, right, that's what they want to do. Yeah, every single one of our daughters, yeah, that's what they want to do. And, this, and all that is is feminism. It's corporate feminism and it's creeped into fundamentalism and that's what it is. That's exactly what it is. Prove it wrong. They never will. They won't have that conversation. You think Mr. Big Britches, are, they're going to have those conversations? You think those guys bringing in, forking over, having to pay for their $5 million buildings? You think they're, they're going to be able to have that conversation? No, they can't, even, they can't even stand up to the governor when they're begging him to let him open. Please, Mr. Governor, please let us have our building. We obeyed you and licked your toes. Would you please just let us in? 
let us in by the hair of our chinny chin chin. That's really kind of what he sounds like. Um, it was pathetic to watch a man of God stand there and yeah. beg this guy to let him in that building. It was pathetic. I'm like, this is the fighting fundamentalist? Really? What are you fighting with, a hot dog? What happened to your sword? You fighting with an Oscar Mayer wiener or what? Really? Tell him he can have the building. Keep it. You pay for it. Throw it back at him. You keep it, you little devil. I don't want your building. Then again, that's because that's why I'm extreme and why you're here. <laughs> because we're all like, no, I don't, no, no, no. Begging you to go to that building. What are you kidding me? You can keep it, burn it if you want to. I don't care what you do with it. Keep it. Right? But what, but what do you do? What do they do, though? They use young ladies to attract all those. That's not, you're not here to do that. God didn't make you to do that. God made you for one man one day. God made you to get married and to love somebody and to spend the rest of your life being a godly wife and a godly mother. Not to sell your face to some Bible college somewhere and to sell yourself out to some career somewhere. It's not what God wants. And if you've been taught wrong, that's okay. You can get right. You spend years being taught wrong. I got taught wrong. I got taught wrong too. But I just decided when I saw the scriptures, hey, I'm going to obey God. And I didn't know I was going to have five daughters. Right? Like, if you think I'm giving my daughters off to those bums, you got another thing coming. And all these people saying, and, and you have this preacher, Spencer Smith or whatever he is, he's a missionary guy. And, and he's not a bad guy or anything, but he's, but he's talking about... Um, He's saying, you know, if you, if you get assaulted and something happens in your dorm at college, you need to first report it to, to the police, then report it to your parents, and then report it to your pastor. And I'm like, wait a minute. I said, I got an idea. How about you don't go? How about you don't go because you don't find it anywhere in the scriptures? And how about you train your own men for the ministry, ordain them and send them out? And don't send them to that guy so he can steal them all. And take all your youth away from you. And so, it's like, are these guys really that dumb? They like all these churches around, they send their people off to those Bible co Like, are you guys really that dumb? Like, you haven't figured out this scam that here's this guy running around making millions, having having hundreds of thousands of dollars and and and, and all kinds of property and everything else, taking all the youth from the nation, sucking them up into these big box colleges, and you haven't figured that out yet? Like, you guys can't figure out. Well, I got to send my kids off. They got so they bring the college students in. They, these kids come in and sing. And they're like, "Hey, you want to go to this school? We have a lot of fun, right?" And that's we don't learn anything about the Bible, but we sure have a lot of fun. Well, they can have fun here, <laughs> and they'll learn the Bible here. They can stay here. <laughs> they can stay home, amen, with their parents where they belong. Amen. No one's gonna love you like your father, by the way. No one. No one's gonna look at some guy and be like growl at them like your father will. Like no one will growl at somebody like your father will. Paul can growl good too. I've seen it. He's a good growler. He, he can get snarly. So he's going to be really snarly. I just know it. But uh, uh, no, nobody, nobody does that like a dad, right? Nobody does. You, you're gonna, like, you just take one look at me like, eh, I don't think so. I mean, that's how a guy thinks. Like a girl thinks, oh, and the guy's like, hmm. But anyway, that's how, that's how a father thinks. But anyway, I don't know how I got off on that, but it was free. It didn't cost you anything, but it did soak up all my time. Sorry about that. Anyway, I got to keep going. Sorry. I just. Okay. You and I are to instruct our children. We're to charge them to follow the word of God. That's our final authority, that King James Bible. And if it is truly our final authority, then we will obey it, not just claim it. We are doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. Paul said this, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. We are given 
to instruct them in the future about the friends that they are to have. We are supposed to do that. The book of Proverbs, and I'm going to read you a few of these and we're going to go. But Proverbs 5, 1, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Thou mayest regard discretion, and thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. You're going to teach your children about the strange woman. Be very clear what a strange woman is. I mean lay it out. Don't, don't confuse them. Be very clear what God's word says. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for prey, for a prey and increaseth the transgressors among, them, among men. You're to, you're to warn them, a whore is a deep ditch. You ain't climbing out of that one sometimes. It'll cost you. It'll cost you. We're to instruct them on working hard and building good character, being diligent, hard workers. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 1. My son, if thou be a surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go humble thyself and make sure of thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Of the fowler. So you're, you're to be careful. You're to teach them about money, about finances, about being careful about some decisions they make and how they get involved with other people financially and how that could, that could, that could destroy them. We're to teach them about their character to work. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Right? We're to teach them, providing her meat in the summer and gathering her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, traveleth, and, the, and thy want as an armed man. To charge them to, to, to seek biblical wisdom. So we're to instruct them. We're, we're to give them some instruction about even sleep. Like, don't raise your children to be bums that don't want to get out of bed. Right? Get up, get to work, get your stuff done. You teach them character that they have work to do. It's time to get up to do it. Amen? Doesn't, by the way, how I feel has no result on what I do. If I'm physically able to. If I have responsibilities, I just got to do them. I got to fulfill them. Right? Especially, especially young ladies, because the one thing you have to teach, mothers, they don't get much of a break. Mothers are not like, oh, I think I'll take a nap for like four hours. No. Um, that's not going to happen. But what, what that shows you is when your daughter is going to say, oh, I have a stomach ache or this or that. Well, that's true. And you can be sympathetic to that. I'm not telling you not to be. But one thing you have to teach them is you got to get up and do things as a lady. Yeah, but dad's dead when he has a cold. Yeah, I know. But that's, that's just, that's just you, don't, you don't understand. You don't understand what a man goes through when he has a cold. All right. So we don't even want to go there. All right. You don't understand that. All right. The closest thing that I can, I can explain to you mothers about that is giving birth to a man having a cold. That's about, that's about, that's the closest thing that when a guy has a cold, he's, I mean, it's pretty bad. All right. Right. It's about as bad. So anyway, no, but seriously, for ladies, they, they don't get that option. They don't get that break too often. And you teach your daughters by that, that you know what? There's a lot of things. And men, you know, we suck it up and have to do what we need to do too. But the point is, is that, is that for, for ladies, they're always working. It's like somebody said that. I, I, told, I told people on my broadcast about a week ago or so, maybe it's two weeks ago now, I said, I wouldn't sell my wife out cheap to the world. There isn't anybody that could pay me what my wife is worth. There, there, there's no career. There's no amount of money. There's no hourly wage. There's nothing that they could give me that has the value of what my wife is to me, nothing. So I would never send her to work for somebody else. I would never send, why? Because she's too valuable to me for that. That's, I wouldn't sell out cheap. You shouldn't either. You shouldn't either, ever. You train your daughters the same way. I wouldn't sell out cheap for that. No way. You, you, the value is too great, it's too high. They couldn't give you enough. 
And especially to be out of the will of God, they couldn't give you enough. He charged them to have biblical wisdom. Proverbs 2, 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words, hide my commandments with thee, so thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. By the way, you're to teach him to accept correction. In Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not thou the chastening, not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Proverbs 4.10, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in, in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not in the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. He teaches him not to be friends with evil men. Yoke yourself up with evil men. Oh, they're nice in this. No, they're not nice in any way. If they're evil and against God's will, then no, they're not nice. They, they might be subtle. Subtle's not nice. Right? They may have deception in their heart. They may have flattery. They may flatter you. But that flattery is covering, they got a knife that they're ready to stick you with. Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly. And who knoweth the ruin of them both? Right? You're to teach them about that. Teach them not to meddle with people that are constantly given to change. Proverbs 31, 2, What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Not for kings, O Lemuel, does not for kings to drink wine, or for princes, strong drink. You teach him to abstain from alcohol, abstain from liquor. You teach him as a parent. You teach him that as a father. As a mother, you teach them those things. These are things, uh, the Bible verse says here, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Hope you're charging them, instructing them, comforting them, exhorting them. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the power of God unto salvation. Thank you for the words of eternal life that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, save the lost among us. Strengthen the saved. Help us to be the fathers that honor and glorify you. Help us to raise our children right. Help us to be an encourager of them. Help us to be an exhorter. Help us to charge them and comfort them. Be the fathers that you would have us to be to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.